keep Jim in your prayers. He wasn't able to come to the breakfast Tuesday, and he enjoys those times. And I knew when he didn't show that he, he wasn't doing well. Anybody else? Brother Ronnie, our daughter in law, Nikki, I think she was going to have surgery. She's been sick for several days with her gallbladder. She was on a business trip, and they had to fly her back home. Joel Berry and myself, we both had Bob's who's done the same day, um, different parts of the state, but the same day. And uh, I find out Wednesday, they tell me. And I don't know when they tell me. When are they going to tell you? I don't know. Probably more here. That's what they told me, maybe Monday or Tuesday, but I'm scheduled to be back over there Wednesday anyway, so they might wait till then. We got a roar on our feedback. Okay. Brother Ronnie? Yes. Uh, Kimberly Birdwell. Yes. Has had oral surgery and she's having problems with it. Dry <coughs> socket. <clears throat> She's got dry sockets. I, I saw that. She was begging for somebody to come and take her to the doctor. I, I couldn't get a hold of her. I told her, I said, I would, but I'm on my way myself. <laughs> I couldn't get a hold of her to let her know. I guess it was too late in yeah. the night to let her know that Nikki would take her. But her sister did take off work. Right. Intact. Shoot, I've got to pull her teeth. <laughs> <laughs> she wouldn't even have to win over there. That's right. Just meet you down there at the barn. Amen. Anybody <laughs> else? <clears throat> All right, let's go to the Lord in prayer then and ask Him to uh, meet with us today. Father in heaven, we thank you for this time of year to thank you that we are celebrating the birth of our Lord our Savior and best of all our friend yes. Lord we thank you that you're able to do exceedingly above all we ask or think and that we can share our burdens one with another and then pray for each other. Lord, we pray especially for unspoken requests. We know there are several here. Lord, we pray for Brother Jim. We pray, Lord, that Jules test will come back where there's no problem. Lord, we do pray for Kimberly that you'll take the pain from her body and help the doctors to be able to fix a problem. And we ask you, Lord, that you would speak to us spiritually today about this time of year. And as we look at four or five different people, may we see how you view them. And Lord, we pray that you'll use us in the same way that people might see Jesus in us, the hope of glory. We ask you to be with these that David has mentioned, his daughter-in-law, 
Or you already know what the problem is and how to fix it. And I pray that your will that you'll do that. We ask you now to bless the singing, bless the service, and may we all leave here today saying it's been good to have been in the house of the Lord. For we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. May we see this and be shared this two or three uh, announcements with you. Next Sunday night, not tonight, but next Sunday night, uh, Brother Teddy will be uh, speaking to us about church security. And, uh, hopefully, uh, we'll learn something. And then, don't forget, uh, the 20th will be our Christmas fellowship. Uh, at 6 o'clock, bring a covered dish and have fellowship with us. And we'll celebrate the Lord's birth. And also, there's a box sitting on the table downstairs because you look around, some of you send cards, some of you get cards without addresses on them. And there's a, it's already wrapped. It's sitting there if you just want to fix Christmas cards. And they'll be handed out. You can bring them in, drop them in that box, and say, what is it, 40 some cents now? I forgot. It's on, it's on the little table out here in the corner now. Because a lot of people don't come through downstairs and come up to the front door. So it's a. Okay. That'd be good. Uh, and then. I want to say just a word about next Sunday night. Um, there were just seven of us at the meeting Tuesday. And uh, we had talked about it and our state promotional man was there. And he said, he called the name and I wished I would wrote it down. I remember him from years past in North Carolina. Almost had it. But anyway, regular routine. The preacher comes in on Monday morning. The secretary is there. The preacher gets the uh, money out of the safe. He comes out of his office and starts through the sanctuary. And he meets a man with a gun coming in. And the preacher ran to the bathroom and locked the bathroom door. Uh, Brother Glenn said the man with the gun shot through the door and shot the Free Will Baptist preacher. Mm -hmm. And then we heard last week what happened in Nashville. Twenty-some shots right in the churchyard. The preacher pushed a button that summons a police officers that already had some training. The people in the church knew right where to go, what to do, to lock the doors, to make sure nobody got in or nobody got out where the shooting was taking place. That's, that's in our door, Nashville, Tennessee. And so I hope you'll be here because I... Uh, Anyway, you don't need to be blind. You don't need to stick your head in the sand. We all need to be on the same page and know what to do without panicking. And so uh, Brother Teddy's worked long and hard and changed some things. And uh, he's been in this for more than 35 years. And uh, we don't want to let that kind of talent slip away from us and that kind of knowledge. So uh, I, I enjoyed going to talk to Miss Phelps. You know, I love to hear the, the story, the knowledge that they have of years gone by 
You might not like history like that, but I do. Uh, and see how we've progressed. Some things we've got better in and some things we've really got worse in. And we need to turn it around and uh, I guess be educated to the time and day that we're living. I told them Wednesday night, the funeral that I was in last Monday or Tuesday, I forgot what day now, too many. But it was over a mile long. And standing at the graveside, Angel uh, Looney said, Brother Ronnie, I heard what happened at West End. Some of you probably hadn't. But I thought, anyway, a guy came in, wanted enough money to fill his car up, and I said, don't have it. Awful looking car, and he's headed to Mississippi or somewhere. Don't want to get on the interstate without his car being filled. Long story short, maybe you've overlooked some money. Take your billfold out and let's look through it. Right here two weeks ago. That's not a good feeling. You know, when they tell you to take your wallet out of your pocket, and let's look through it. And, uh, <clears throat> it's getting to the point that uh, we need to be aware of our surroundings. My wife walked out of Kroger's with Donna a few years ago and not paying much attention, walking to the car. She got hit from the back, pulled to the ground, broke the strap of her pocketbook, and the man ran with her skin up on the pavement. I wasn't there. I was home studying. And if it can happen to her, as poor as she looks, <laughs> some of you look rich, you're in trouble. You know, I, it, it scared her daughter and my daughter to death uh, for that to happen. She was with her. And, but it woke both of them up. They are very conscious of the surroundings now. So, uh, it's happened to us. We've been robbed that way. We've been robbed while we were at church, just like Harry and Jewel have, like Mark, Barry, and Lynette have. <clears throat> when you go home and the whole furnace is gone from one year, that that's a robbery to me. And uh, we just need to be aware. Well, That's in the meantime, I'm going to say. <clears throat> well, in the meantime, not to be comical. Yes, sir. But I'm serious. If something like that was to come during church service, for God's sakes, don't get between me and whoever's welding that gun. <laughs> Hit the floor. I, I agree. Some sheriff out west, it was on the news, said if you've got a permit to be armed, then be on. And when you shoot, you shoot to kill because you're fighting for your life. You know, and we're in church talking about this. But if God's people don't do right, the world's sure not going to do right. That's enough, I guess. We'll let Nicole come and lead us in another song and, uh, please be here next week and if you know other churches and got friends in them tell them about especially ushers and trustees it's, it's almost a mandatory thing and uh, church officers janitors people that are here by themselves a lot of times you sure do not be talking about going.
page 148. Um, I'd like to ask for a special prayer for my sister. Um, she's struggling to be a new mom. She's not getting enough sleep. I think there's a touch of postpartum depression. So if y'all will just, just pray for her. Take, take the worry and the, the meanness, the whatever depression causes out of her. Um, she hasn't done anything yet, but my mom's just concerned. And um, I just don't want it to lead to that. I don't know what Randy's feeling. I don't know what she's going through. Um, I don't know what postpartum depression feels like. I didn't feel it with Chloe. So if y'all will just lift her up. And have the Lord to help her and comfort her. Okay, if y'all will turn your mix to page 148. And let's stand while we sing, We Three Kings of Orion are. Page 148. Three nights to teach her that. I love piano music. Really good. Have your Bibles. We're going to start this morning and just look at uh, several people involved in the Christmas story. And we'll hear more about these people as we get closer. And we're going to start naturally. You cannot turn to Luke 2 without reading the Christmas story. And uh, so that's where I want to turn. Luke 2, and I think about this often. The last Christmas that Regina's mother was with us here on earth, we would always try to go see my parents in Asheville, North Carolina, and then go, we'd have Christmas or would you call it lunch there and then Christmas dinner with Regina's mom and family. But I remember standing at the foot of her bed and she said, I can't tell you what she called me, but she said, us use Ronnie. Ronnie, there's a Bible over there. Would you read me the Christmas story. And so got the Bible turned to Luke 2. Precious memories. You know. Reading the Christmas story. And as I said to our Sunday school teacher, Brother Kenny, this morning, when he's teaching about Moses, <coughs> you know, it doesn't get old. The Bible just doesn't get old. It's fresh every morning. Like God said, my grace is fresh every morning. My mercy endures forever. And his mercy is new every day. And so in the next few minutes, and I'll not keep you long because we're going to see these individually as the month progresses. In Luke 2, verse 11, For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. I don't know about you, but that would have just meant so much to me if I was alive back then and heard an angel say that. I'd say, it's finally come. Like I'm looking for the upper taker now. 
I'm listening for the sound of the trumpet and the voice of the archangel and time to be declared no more and to go home to be with Jesus. That's what I'm looking for. But history, his story, it's all about the one that we're going to read about today. As a savior, Himself is the very center of this wonderful story. Without Jesus, there'd be no Christmas story. Without Him, we'd have no Bible. And we shall begin with Him. And I'm going to talk about several other people, but He's the star. Then seek. Uh, to fit the others in as we go one by one. When Joseph and Mary arrived in the town to register their names in the census, they found that the homes of their friends were already fully occupied. So they were compelled to go to a common inn and the common inn means like a, a motel. It's a place where people traveling can stay. So they went to the inn. But there too, every room was already crowded. And I get to thinking, the creator of the world was born that night in Bethlehem and laid in a manger, the creator of the world, born, and there wasn't room for it. And we're talking about the king of kings. We're talking about the potentate. We're talking about somebody that has no rival. That nowadays, somebody would be moved from a room and he would be put in. He would take charge. But we find that if Joseph and Mary, and certainly they did because they came from everywhere to register and to pay taxes, tribute, we find that Mary and Joseph made it they registered all right. Then her being great with child. They said we need a room. And reminds me a little bit. And there's no comparison. But just to get a point across. When Steve Lytle's mother died. I remember right where I was. I was turning into signature furniture war, uh, furniture store by myself to look for my wife a Christmas present. And my phone rang and I answered it and it was Steve. And he said, Brother Ronnie, my mom just died. And I don't know anybody else that she'd rather have preach her funeral than you. And I realize it's a long ways to come. You already know what I said. It's not too far. I'll be there. Came home, told Regina what was going on, packed an overnight bag, suitcase, Hung my suit up in the car. And I'm driving that white Buick that I drove for so many years before I traded for the red one. And I, I get to Swannanoa, and they just have one little funeral home there. And I thought, well, I need to go 
to the Swannanoa church, changed clothes, put my suit on, and I could almost walk as close from the church to WDBL to the funeral home. That's what I did. I went to the church. I pulled in the church. And the light started blinking. A horn started blowing. And I thought, I want them to know I'm here, but I didn't do that on purpose. <laughs> I get out, raise the hood, and I'm looking for wires to unplug. And so I unplug the horns, turn the switch off, and just pray my lights don't go or kill the battery. And I thought, well, I better take a cable loose. So I did. I drove without lights from here to there. And without a horn, I didn't want to arrive at one of my best friend's mother's funeral blowing horns. That's happened to me two or three times. But I go in, and long story short, people started coming by. Where are you staying? Where are you staying? Steve walked up to me and he said, I heard somebody asked you where are you staying. You could stay with us, but our whole family's in. Every room we've got is full. They're in sleeping bags in the kitchen floor. We don't have no room for you. Brother Hollifield said, Preacher, you could stay with us, but you know my wife. Unless she's got a 48-hour notice, she don't want other people coming in. Nothing against you. It will be anybody. And I know her. And he was right. And I thought, okay, no problem. And I said, you know, there's motels either way. Black Mountain is five miles that way. Oak Teen is two or three miles that way. There's a room. I can find a room. And about, I don't know how many people said you could stay with us, but there's no room. That made me feel a little sad. But imagine Mary and Joseph knowing that God had told them that she had conceived of the Holy Ghost and that that child she was carrying would be the King of Kings and the Savior of the world and the monarch of monarchs and no greater than the child she was carrying and there's no room. <laughs> And then my first bus driver, when we started our bus ministry, a man named Chuck Norman and Linda, they came in. The funeral home's full, and I don't know where he heard it, but Chuck walked in right where I was by the casket with Steve. He hugged my neck and he said, Brother Ronnie, I've just heard that you don't know where you're staying. And I said, not yet, I don't. I said, but if I have to sleep in the car, I can do that. I've done it before. He said, oh, no. Our kids are grown and gone, and there's three bedrooms in our house. We use one of them. You come and pick out the one you want, and you're staying with us. That ain't how it was with Jesus. They tried everywhere. And guess where he ended up? In a barn. The king of kings that created everything that was made was made by him. And there was no room for him. And I know today, I know some of you, I know your hearts, and I know you would say, you can have my bed. I'll find somewhere. You can
can have my bed. I'll sleep in the barn. Joseph, bring her into my house. I'll go to the stable. Wasn't that way back then. Because Satan already was working. He didn't want him born anyway. And then there's probably more to that story than we'll ever know if we get to heaven. There's one beautiful lady here today that says to me almost every day that we talk about it at Christmas, I believe he was born in a barn to give the animals hope. I don't know. I'm not going to say no. Because Jesus died for everything that has breath. The Bible teaches us everything that has breath. Praise the Lord. And so we see that Mary and Joseph, they're the main ones that I wanted to talk about today, but I want you to see that Satan has tried to take him out from the beginning. No room, and I've already received five Christmas cards, and just two of them have Xmas in it. You know what Xmas means when you sign Merry Xmas? You just took Christ out of Christmas. Sure. And that's a sneaky way that the devil does it. And I mean good people that I know, good people that I love, nobody from this church. It's other folks that know better. But don't sign your cards, X. Must take just a few minutes, and if you don't know how to spell it, do like I do. Call Teresa. <laughs> <laughs> or, or call Regina, and she'll ask her phone, and it'll tell her how to spell it. You know, I hate it when a phone's smarter than I am. Amen. I hate that. But think about it. We need to keep Christ in Christmas and standing here and facing 52 or 53 other countries. It's not happy holiday to me. It's still Merry Christmas. Right, and will be till Jesus calls me home. Amen. And so, I might not be politically correct, but my heart feels better when I can say Merry Christmas and joy to the world and peace on earth and goodwill toward men. I want to keep it the old-fashioned way. And so we see that uh, what they faced the very first night. Let's move to the second person. I told you it wouldn't take but a minute. And there are just four people. Mary and her meekness. Look at Luke chapter 1. You're already there. And verse 38. Luke 1 and verse 38. And Mary said, Behold the handmaiden of the Lord, be it unto me according to thy word. And the angel departed from her. Think about that. Mary was so meek. The mother of the Lord, a very wonderful person, although being as humble as she was when the angel Gabriel visited her and told her the startling news that she was chosen of God to be the mother of Jesus. Her reaction, I think, were remarkable. Do you see what she said? 
Behold, I'm just a handmaiden of the Lord. But be it according to thy word. Behold, then the wonder of Mary just come to complete submission to the will of God. I would to God that every one of us under the sound of my voice today, including our computer audience or TV audience, would do what Mary did and say, whatever you want, Jesus, that's what I want. And that's what Mary said. Be it unto me according to your word. Let's don't change it to where Christ is not there. I understand to somewhat taking the name Bible College out of our college, but it still hurts me Amen. that we can't call it a Bible College. It seems like we're getting pushed farther and farther away from the will of God. Farther and farther. Jesus said, go and make me known. Shout it from the housetops. Tell people what I've done for you. And yet, we're saying, okay, let's scratch Jesus off. Let's scratch uh, Bible out of our school. Let's take we take Bible out of our school. We raise up these children. And the book says, and this generation knows not God. That's what your book says. When you take Jesus out of it, that generation's raised without him. But Mary said, I'm willing to do whatever it takes to please the Heavenly Father. And she's just a young, young girl and became the mother of our Lord and Savior. That's remarkable. And then look at Luke 2, number 3, and we just got <coughs> Number 3, found in Luke 2, verses 13 and 14. Luke 2, verses 13 and 14. And suddenly there was with the angel, and watch the wording, a multitude of heavenly hosts praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, goodwill, toward men. Now, I want you to think with me. This was an angelic choir sent down from above to show heaven's delight in the birth of the Savior. I don't know if you've ever looked at it this way. There wasn't an earthly crowd of people to invite the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. There wasn't a crowd there. But God took care of it. God looked over heaven and said, my son's being born on a place called earth. I want you to go down there and Give him a welcome part. And the Bible says there was a multitude that came from glory. And they sang and praised his name and told who he was and said, Glory be to God and peace on earth toward men. People weren't there, but heaven was. God saw to it that His Son had 
a welcome party. We've got people today that don't believe in the birth of the Savior. We've got people today that don't believe that Jesus Christ was ever born. Or if He was, He was just a man. Listen, it's been well over 2,000 years ago. And He's still as real to me today as He was the day I got saved. He's real. He can speak to us in the midnight hour, in the quietness of the moment. And somebody told me just this week, they said, you know, I love where I live. This is them talking. Because I can go out in the yard, or in the backyard, and listen, and it's dead silence. I said, you know, we could do that too. Silence is gold. Gaylor Gower turned that around on me one time, though, and he said, I just came back from your dad's house one Wednesday night. He said, silence is so loud out there that it's deafening. <laughs> I got the message. And I would to God I could go visit him more now than I did then. There'll come a time when we can. But thank God we've got eternity together. This, I think, God saw that it was a vast throne, possibly numbering in the thousands, to honor this babe born in Bethlehem. It was visible. It was evident. It was the presence of God Almighty on earth in a baby form. And he was with his people. For now, Emmanuel is born. I think this is what some call the third wonder. Therefore, is the joy of heaven in the birth of Jesus Christ. That's the joy of heaven. The fourth one. Is the shepherds. Luke. We're going to have to. Well Luke chapter 2 verse 15. Luke 2 15. Right under where we just read it. And it came to pass. As the angels were gone away. From them into heaven, the shepherds said one to another, Let us now go even unto Bethlehem and see this thing which has come to pass, which the Lord hath made known unto who? us. Now the Bible says what it means and means what it says. He didn't go to king. He didn't go to emperors. He didn't go to high authority people. He went to shepherds and told them first. That means something. We're going to see part of it right here. He didn't go to the great men of the world. with this wondrous news of the birth of Jesus first, but rather he went to humble shepherds. How fitting it was that they should be honored, for he himself was the shepherd of Israel. Think about it. He went to his own. And had come as the good shepherd to give his life for his sheep. And guess who the sheep are? We are. He's our shepherd. We're his sheep. 
Oh, I saw this thing somebody sent me on the internet the other day and I was looking at it and it said, watch the picture closely. And here's a herd of sheep. One man goes to the gate and he hollers for the pig, pig <laughs> the sheep to come. They just keep eating. They don't even look up. He walks away. Another man goes up there. He says, I can get them to come. He rattles a bucket and he hollers for them to come. They don't look up. They still just pick him. But the shepherd, the owner, the master, walked to the gate cried one time and here they come galloping. My sheep hear my voice and they know who I am. Isn't that wonderful? That we will hear His voice one day and we'll hear our name called I want to tell you, I've never been the fastest runner, but I'm going to be with a group. Shepherds. The last one I want to mention to you. Well, closing out their part, their response was immediate. Let us now go and see. They said, that's a fine example for all of us. Thus we have the wonder of an immediate and courageous decision. Let's go now. And if you're here today and you've been playing church for years and you're not saved, you're not fully sold out to Christ, you're not obeying His voice. You're not obeying His word. You're not obeying His commandments. You're not listening to Him. Today would be the day to come and say, whatever you want me to do, I'm willing to do it 110%. For He says, you have, I'm going to paraphrase this. I know what it says, but I want you to understand it. What business do you have calling me your father when you won't do what I've asked you to do? We think we've got a better plan than he is. Folks, they ain't a better plan than his. If our government would just read this book and go by this book, mm -hmm. we would have ever need met. Mm -hmm. We wouldn't have homeless vets laying on blankets and alleys. We wouldn't have people starving to death in our country. If we just do what the book says. But our way is better. Folks, our way is not better. Never been a better way than Jesus. He said, I'm the way, I'm the truth, I'm the life. So, not to the great men of the world was he pronounced but to the humble shepherds how fitting this was. He was himself a shepherd. Their response was immediate. But we got to go home and think about it. You know, if the Bible says it, that settles it. They ain't no thinking about it. If the Bible says it, you don't even have to pray about it. It's already been prayed over. 
It's already been told us what to do. But we live in a day and time when it's my way or the highway. I'm going to do it my way. Regina and I talked to a person this week going through some very difficult times. Matter of fact, two or three people and families. And it seems like Christmas time is a bad time to do that. And this one said, I don't know what to do. And I said, you know what I'd do if I was in your shoes? And I said, I can't do it very well. I just sang this song. One day at a time, sweet Jesus, that's all I'm asking from you. Help me today. Show me the way one day at a time. You see, we think about next week and next year. We just need to think about today. And he'll get us through today. I don't know how many times I've done my best to sing that song to me. One day at a time. And I don't have time to tell you the whole story, but remember the illustration about the clock that just had a nervous breakdown? The big grandfather clock. And the owner called the clock doctor, and the clock doctor comes out, takes it all apart, reassembles it, says, I can't find a thing in the world wrong with this clock. And the clock doctor said to everybody, you just move, I'm going to talk to the clock. What's wrong with you? Well, I just got to thinking about all the clicks that I got to click, one ever second. Sixty ever many. Thousands every day. And I can't take no more. And the doctor said, do you have trouble clicking, ticking one time? No, I can do that. That's all you got to do is one tick at a time. You overwhelm yourself. And Satan wants to overwhelm you. But we can all do one tick at a time. In closing, think about this. Their response was immediate. Let us now go, they said. Thus we have the wonder of an immediate and <clears throat> courageous decision to follow Jesus. We've got a church, I found out Tuesday, and I told them Wednesday night, that don't have a preacher. They've sent Bible college students out there. They've sent young preacher boys just trying to find a church to start and they all say not big enough not enough money I've never or Regina neither one of us have ever even asked a church what do you pray we've prayed about it if they voted us in we figured he will supply the need. One way or the other, he'll supply the need. But people now are looking for a contract. They're looking for big bucks and something already established. They don't want to work. They don't want to beat the bushes. They don't want to win souls. 
God's took care of us. Tears fill my eyes sometimes when I think how he's blessed us. We've got a wonderful church. I think we've got the best foundation and the best church that we've ever had since I've been here. And I love every one of you from the bottom of my heart. And I know you love me and you proved it over and over. And my wife has not packed her china in over five years. <laughs> so you love <like> her too. <laughs> it's wonderful to be for your love to where you want. But when there's no room for you and you don't feel comfortable, that's a miserable feeling. This is the last one. Found in Matthew, you're going to have to turn. Matthew chapter 2 and verse 2. Just back one book. Matthew 2, 2. The star and it shining. It says, saying, Where is he that is born king of the Jews? For we have seen his star in the east and are come to worship Him. This was one of the miracles of the first Christmas. It was only to be expected that God, that can do miracles, would do something out of the ordinary on this holy occasion, and He did. We have seen his star and we've come to worship him. Where is he? I want to close with this question. Where is he in your life? Is he king of your life? Is he your Lord and Savior? Do you obey Him? <clears throat> do you do what this book says to do? This is a precious book. Still alive today. And you can't get saved by works. But you can't out give Jesus. He's given far more to us than we can ever give to Him. But I hope today something has been said or done to stir your mind that we need to keep Him the reason for the season. That'll make all the difference in the world. Let us pray. Brother Kenny Norton, dismiss us in prayer, please, sir.